let's get on with uh, part three of the differential form introduction. Um, I don't have the usual setup I do for by hand drawing, so this might be a little light on the pi lighter on the pictures that I want. Um, I wanted to make a, a com one more comment about these, this idea of taking a function and taking d of that function. I guess I don't even have to write it. It's right up here. Um, this is, gives you a certain special kind of one form where the components are the three partial derivatives of one single function. We know that's a special kind of thing. Just like this, if you made this i plus this j plus this k, that'd be the gradient. That's a special kind of vector field. It's a conservative vector field. Well, df uh, is called it's a, a form of that form, if you know what I mean, is called an exact one form. And so if you have maybe some general differential form alpha, pdx plus qdy plus rdz, if it can be expressed as df, it's called an exact one form. And so this is the analog of the gradient or of a conservative vector field. <clears throat> and this idea of an exact one form is, is going to be uh, very interesting to us. Okay, So that's all I want to say about one forms for now. I want to start t talking about differential two forms. Okay, well what's the purpose of a differential two form? Well our main purpose for it is it's going to be something that we can integrate over a 2D surface. And that could be in two dimensions, in which case it's just a patch, a region in the plane. Or our most common example for these lectures is going to be in 3D, and that gets much more interesting. Okay, So this is what we used to do. We used to do is the flux of a vector field. And if you think about the definitions for the flux of a vector field, it seems very different from the integral of a uh, um, a vector field along a curve. And part of what we're going to accomplish with forms is we're going to unify. We're going to see that they really are they really are the same thing. It's just that a vector f a, uh, along a curve you should be integrating a one form uh, and on a surface you really e shouldn't even really be integrating a vector field. You should really be doing a differential two form. So here is where it's going to start going to start to look more different. Before it seemed like maybe a notational switch. Here Hopefully it'll start to look a little bit more different. Okay, and one really, really, really important thing is that I'm going to caps and bold it. Overemphasis. It's um, we know that we can only integrate like when we do fluxes and things like that only over oriented two-dimensional surfaces, and that's going to be true for differential two forms. Just like we could only integrate a a form over a an oriented curve. Um, this is going to be a very important thing. Orientations. Okay, so what about the microscopic version of that? If uh, the microscopic version of integrating a one form on a curve was letting a one form eat a vector, that was this this thing up here. Well, the microscopic version is that a two form, a two form, can eat or be paired with or act on as a function to be used somewhat more technical language. I'll just say eat. Two form can eat. Um, well, what's a microscopic bit of surface? We actually know that from the analysis we had to do to develop the idea of the flux of a vector field. It's a little uh, parallelogram formed by two vectors. And that's something we've seen with the cross product and all kinds of stuff. That keeps coming up. Okay. So let's see, I have a little picture. So the st standard thing, if I have two vectors in R3, U and V, I can make the little parallelogram that they form. And we want to think usually of U and V as very tiny little vectors. Like maybe we have some curve, and this is the displacement along that curve in a tiny little time dt. And here's the displacement along the curve in a tiny time dt. And so we want to think of this as a microscopic bit of surface. So that's going to be the microscopic version, which we might want to think about as well as something that, that informs our idea of a two form. So here's um, our first example. And that's going to be, I'm going to use a little bit of a weird notation for it. It's going to be built out of two one forms. And it's actually fairly familiar for us to see an expression like a form dx dy. That happens in multiple integrals. Um, and we're used to that as being that as an instruction for doing an iterated integral. I'm going to put a little wedge in between those guys. 
And this is going to be called the wedge product of dx and dy. And this is going to be our first example of a two form. So let me show you a picture of that. Um, I'm going to co concentrate on the picture first and then uh, later talk about the mechanics and the more official version. So here's the picture. Here's dx. Um, oh, you know what? Ah, I don't need to save that. Here's dx. Remember, the idea is it's the stack picture in three dimensions. This is a l one dimension up from what we were doing with the vector field analyzer. Here's a stack of plates. And um, if I want to integrate a line integral, if I want to integrate a dx over some curve, I would just trace the curve and count how many plates it goes through. If I wanted to pair this with a uh, with a vector, then I would just take that take an arrow and pierce through this thing and see how many uh, thing how many er how many layers I I pierced. Um, I didn't put an indication of direction here. I probably should have. So we could put like a little arrow, um, maybe like a little arrow on here saying this is the positive direction for for uh, for evaluating integrals or pairings with vectors. So there's dx. Now dy is the similar kind of stack picture, but just going in the other direction. Oh yeah, let's say that. dy is just going in the y direction. And again, let's, uh, I think I still got that. Let's remember there's a little notation of, yeah, a little notion of orientation here. Say so that's the positive direction in the in the y direction, and so again, an, an integral of a curve is just how many times you, things you go through. The integral of a, a vector, or the pairing of the vector, is how many times the arrow goes through that. And then, what would dx dy be? This is the beauty of this stack picture. One of the beauties of this stack picture. We just superimpose the pictures on each other. And yeah, I'll go ahead and save that little modification. We just superimpose the pictures, and voila. So it came out a little funky looking. Ignore the, the weird blob on top of it for a second. Um, what I'm trying to indicate is that I'm just really superimposing the layers of the dx and the layers of the dy. And I probably should have uniformly colored it um, or maybe made this not transparent or something like that. Um, but what you want to think of is like a, an egg crate thing. It's actually kind of like the packaging you have for light bulbs. Picture like fluorescent tubes in here and cardboard. So picture this is made out of cor corrugated cardboard. And we've got these tubes here. Um, this is dx dy, and that's a picture of it. Well, what does that mean? This is a picture of it. Okay, here's the idea. Um, we were talking about how flux of a vector field is what we're trying to replace. We're trying to replace this idea of integrating a vector field to calculate a flux. Well, look at these tubes, and instead of thinking of fluorescent light bulbs gently packed in cardboard, now think these are made about plastic, and water can flow through these vertical channels, and um, what we're going to do is we're going to place a surface surface over this. So that's what this weird blob is. It's just a random surface, and I'm indicating some sort of parameterization lines on it, maybe. And I'm going to calculate the integral of dx dy over the surface by just counting how many tubes of worth of fluid, how many of these individual tubes worth of fluid are going to go through. Um, I get this is something where I'd, I'd like the by hand kind of drawing because I don't want to do this on the computer. But imagine, well, actually, I can probably do this. Imagine that we um, double, yeah, here we go, the density of lines. Remember when the lines get closer together, it's like level curves. That's indicating denser. Yeah, this works fine. Um, that's indicating doubling. I'm doubling dx and dy here. So I'm going to quadruple dx times dy. So this is going to be 4 times dx dy. I've got many more tubes of flux going through here. So this is a great thing. I can combine two one forms to get a two form, and it immediately gives me a picture of what the integral of that over a surface is going to be. You just count how many of these individual tubes are actually going through your surface. Again, that's something you can't do with a vector field. If I just drew a bunch of arrows going through a surface, I can't eyeball the number. I have to get a scale. I have to get a scale on, on the arrows on the surface. Here, it's just counting. Uh, very much like the integral uh, for a uh, a one form, and if this surface happens to be just a small little parallelogram, whoops, um, if it just happens to be a parallelogram, well, I just count the tubes of flux going through that parallelogram. Now nah, it's not going to look much like a parallelogram, okay? And I just count the tubes going through that, and we're going to get the integral of dx dy, okay? So that's the picture I want you to have in your mind here. Well, can we be a little bit more precise about that? Well, the integral, mm, the integral over a surface of dx 
wedge dy. Oops. Well, that's just going to be the flux of this upward vector field. And before I modified it, how many um, th how many tubes of flux were going through? Well, these these original things. Wait, before I put in the extra stuff, were one unit apart, and these were one unit apart in x. So it's just counting basically how many grid squares on the xy plane is this lying over. Okay. So in fact, it turns out that that's just the area of the shadow of the surface S on the xy plane. Okay. Well, so that's something that's that's a good thing to know. That's something we could actually calculate. It's just not the area of the surface itself. It's just the area of the shadow of that surface on the xy plane. Um, so that's our first example, at least of one way to calculate the integral of an explicit two-form dx wedge dy. Um, we're going to get a better way to do this in much more generality, but I wanted to mention that there's actually a pretty easy way to do that. Okay, so here's maybe the most important thing about forms. It's a, such an important thing about forms. Remember this idea that this was all about oriented surfaces. Okay? And in particular, if I look at this idea of taking the little parallelogram, the vectors u and v, um, that's supposed to be an oriented parallelogram, and it's supposed to matter what the orientation is. So let me remind you, if you haven't seen already, why are orientations so important? Oh, I should have pre-made a picture for this, but I'll try and freehand it. Why are orientations so important? Well, let me just um, save this and do a new one. Um, let me just do a real simple thing. Here's a rectangle, and here's another rectangle. And I want, it's all about boundaries, because we're leading to Stokes' theorem, and Stokes' theorem is all about boundaries. I want the boundary of the union of these two pieces to be just the outside part. So if I thought of the boundary as just of the, the top rectangle as just these four sets, this set of points, this set of points, this set of points, this set of, set of points, and the boundary of the bottom rectangle as this set of points, this set of points, this set, this set, then if I take the union of those, I would love that the boundary of the whole thing is just the union or the combination somehow of the boundaries of the pieces. The idea that the, the boundary of a combination is the combination of the boundaries is going to be so hugely important. Um, but that's not going to work if I just say, oh, it's going to be this guy counted twice, or maybe just if this guy's going to be in here. If I just think of it as point sets, then I'm not going to sort of be able to erase this. But what if I... Um, Maybe I'll just kind of put this in. What if I put little arrows everywhere? I orient this top guy in such a way that it's boundary, and then I have some convention for boundary orientations. So I'm thinking of this guy maybe as oriented. I'm going to orient it with a little swirly arrow like that. And I'm going to orient this guy with the same swirly arrow so that those orientations are definitely consistent. It's basically just two pieces of a big swirly arrow. So that's all the same orientation. And I'll have a, co a convention that if a, I have a, a piece of surface oriented with this swirly arrow, well then the boundary orientation just follows the swirl. Well now the orientation of this guy, oh this looks interesting, looks like this. When I combine them, then if, as long as I have a rule that any two pieces with opposite orientations cancel out, then these cancel out, and the boundary of the whole thing, the combination of the two rectangles, is just exactly what I want it to be, just the outer boundary. So interior boundary pieces cancel, but they can only cancel if I remember orientations. Um, and, that's, and also this idea of counting oriented things as negative of each other if they're opposite totally makes sense with how we integrate stuff over oriented curves or surfaces because the integral of any vector field, or a one form for that matter, over this curve this way really is the negative of going the other way. So it's, it's really a, a, not a weird artificial convention at all. Okay? So orientations are super important because interior boundaries must cancel. It's a really deep thing. Orientations show up so much, um, and this is really the deepest reason I know of 
Um, and you can sort of trace down a lot of the other, what seem to be other reasons, back to this, that interior boundaries must cancel. Um, so that the boundary of a combination of objects is um, the combination of the boundaries. And I'm going to make that more precise later, but that's the idea. Okay, so oriented. So let's go back to the the idea of a two form. We've got this oriented surface. Um, oh, bear with me here. I like this picture. So we've got this oriented surface, um, or an oriented little rec uh, parallelogram. Remember, the way we orient the parallelogram is we have to remember the order. It's like this vector, then this vector. If we switch the order, we're switching the orientation. We're making that swirl instead of going this way. We're making it go around the other way. So that means that if I switch the order of dx and dy, that's going to change. Okay. If I have dx and dy, what if I switch those two letters? This has the same impact as switching, instead of having this direction and this direction, it has the same impact as switching the directions on this guy. So that says, really important thing, dx wedge dy is negative of dy wedge dx. And that's simply because this guy, its job in life is to be integrated or paired with an oriented object. And oriented objects always switch um, signs when you switch two of the, the building block pieces that they're, they're coming from. Believe it or not, that fact is going to be, um, that's going to produce a whole lot of great consequences for us. Okay, so um, that's a good place to stop this video. We've got our just a tiny taste of what a, uh, actually let me, let me just go a tiny bit further. Um, let me just, I just remembered one more thing I wanted to say. A more general two form, it's kind of weird to only have one example. A more general two form, well we could do this with um, not just x and y, we could take dx wedge dy, and then we could add it in, we could add in dy wedge dz. Or we could add in dz wedge dx. Now notice we're not going to add in dy wedge dx because that's redundant. That's just this with a negative. And if you think about it, these are the only three combinations that actually are going to be different from each other in three dimensions because every other pair of two letters out of three is either one of these or it's or the uh, in the opposite order. But we can also do what we were doing with one forms is multiply these by coefficients. So we could have like uh, p, some function, and q, and r. I'll probably change the order of those if I want to have a standard order. But we're going to have uh, dx wedge dy times a, uh, some function p, dy wedge dz times q. Now these guys are going to be somewhat harder to picture because the tubes instead of being uniformly spaced rectangular tubes um, that kind of join up to each other, we're going to have tubes that, that turn around and twist and get bigger or smaller as they go and open up and then close. And it's going to be like the stack picture for one forms where they might not actually combine nicely into one set of tubes. The thing that is a little misleading about this example with dxdy is that um, it wasn't one little tube picture here, and then down here a totally different set of tubes, and then over here a totally different set of tubes that kind of don't mesh together. That's the general picture, really, of a two-form. Um, just like in the one-form case, we had the little stacks at each point that didn't necessarily mesh together. But still, this idea of these cartons of stuff and these tubes of flux is a really good physical picture for what this more general two-form is going to be. So I'll just leave you with a question that we'll answer in the next one. How do we integrate, um, not just pictorially or approximately or conceptually, how do we really get down to brass tacks and integrate that two-form, which is the general two-form in R3, over an explicit parameterized surface? Turns out it's just going to involve the idea of d of a function and the fact that it in interacts very well with the chain rule, which we've already seen, and <coughs> the fact that um, if this is some sort of multiplication, it should distribute over addition, which it does, and this wonderful anti-commutativity. It turns out just those three basic properties will let us know what we should do with this and show us how all the rigmarole we had to do with fluxes of vector fields comes out very naturally from this story.